getting all these medals is it takes me about 40 minutes to transfer them to my pajamas every night. <laughs> Back again in the mornings. It's not an advantage. Uh, one, two, three. Everybody hear me? Is that, a, is that an advantage? But, okay. Um, well, uh, I'm going to, I don't know the state of uh, your education in physics, so I sort of made this up for uh, the average typical college junior. Uh, but I don't know what the average typical college junior knows. So uh, I will sort of tell you the story of this, and if it comes to a place where you don't know what I'm talking about, you can raise your hand. I'll tell you what, if you have a question, raise your hand. If you don't have a question, but you don't know what I'm talking about, wiggle your fingers. <laughs> and I won't call on you, I'll just figure out that I'm getting some feedback. Okay, so if I, uh, yeah, so if you have a question, just raise your hand, but if you don't have a question, but you don't know what I'm talking about, wiggle your fingers. Isn't that a good code? Yeah. Try that. Um, it's always hard to, to pick a, a subject that is frontier science and yet uh, is, uh, doesn't have a lot of highfalutin uh, theoretical uh, stuff, which often I don't understand. So the title is The Failure of Mirror Symmetry in the Weak Decay of Pions and Neurons. All right. Failure, that you all know about. <laughs> symmetry, probably some of you may know about symmetry. Can anybody give me a definition of symmetry? Maybe there's a, 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 an architect in the audience or somebody who's interested in architecture or art or uh, whatever. Anyone have a, give me an idea of symmetry. Everybody knows what it is in the dictionary. Symmetry, I don't know what it says in the dictionary. Um, Anybody want to Yeah. Left and right mirror image. Mirror image, that's, uh, that's connected. Uh, these guys were thrown out of some other class. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, the, it's, that's a very special kind of symmetry. But normally, when there are less bashful people in the audience, they will say, well, it's like, uh, the left and the right are balanced. You, know, you, you can think of a, a cathedral with two spires that look identical. So it's a symmetry. Uh, any, anybody want to try a, their own definition of symmetry? Oh, wait, what's the hell? Yeah. Something that remains the same after the transforming that from a different Okay, you're, you're getting close to the definition that I want. Normally, see what, what he said was that, uh, that there is something which, when you torture it, it doesn't change. You do something to it. And that, that often when I get a lot of uh, definitions, which are all correct, because they're, uh, then I want to summarize it and I give the official definition which you might find in the, in the, in the dictionary. I, I, someday I'll look it up in a dictionary and see what they really say. We wrote a book on symmetry, which is only $20, and there's a whole bunch of them for sale. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, so it should be in the book, but there's no, yeah, it's, it's in the book. So let, let's try to figure out a definition that would satisfy everybody. And so the first thing we have to do is talk about uh, uh, let's see, do I have any? I know I should have should have bought a bottle of wine because <laughs> then then I could get thirsty and so on. But uh, but if uh, there are many things here's here's a, an object. If you ignore the painting on the object. Then I look at that object and I say, I will call that a physical system. You know, it has uh, plastic, it's got some very unhealthy coffee grounds in there, and all kinds of things. It's, so everything is a physical system. Uh, a 
baseball is a physical system, a planet is a physical system, a solar system would be a physical system. There are many things, almost anything we want to define as a physical system, uh, we can. So here's a physical system, a coffee cup. Now I'm going to do something uh, on that system. I'm going to make, let's call it a fancy word, an operation on that system. I'm not a surgeon, so it's not going to be a surgical operation, but I'm going to do something to the system. I have an idea. I'm going to rotate it through 37 and a half degrees around the vertical axis. That's called an operation. Okay. It looks exactly the same. Didn't change because we we're ignoring all the decoration. <coughs> so we say we define this thing as having a symmetry. So there are three three definitions in three concepts in the definition of symmetry. One is a system, molecule, an atom, in addition to all the other things I mentioned. That's the physical system. The other is the operation. I rotate it. I could do many other things to it. I could move it from here to here. That's another operation, translation. So the second concept, the first is a system, the second is an operation, and the third is a judgment as to what happened. If the system didn't change, I, I move it from here to here, looks exactly the same. So the fancy word for that uh, is invariance. It doesn't change. So if the system is invariant, then we say it has a symmetry. And then we can say, well, what kind of symmetry? And you can then re refine the definition, saying this is a symmetry. It's a rotational symmetry about a vertical axis. If I try to rotate it around a horizontal axis, I'll get coffee all over the table. Somebody will yell at me, so I don't want to do that. But it wouldn't be symmetric around a different axis. Symmetry is around the vertical axis. And there's all sorts of symmetries. I can have a book. I can rotate this. Oh, well, it changes, because now you have the, the binding here. So that's it doesn't have vertical symmetry. But if I maybe uh, turn it. 360 degrees, it has a symmetry. Uh, let's think, some of you may remember that airplanes used to have funny things on the front, you know, with, uh, they call them propellers, three-bladed propeller. If I rotate that propeller through 135 degrees or something like that, it doesn't change because I've replaced uh, the propeller blades uh, exactly so that uh, the vertical one now is at 135 degrees. So that's a symmetry of rotation of about 135 degrees. That's a discrete symmetry. Any, uh, any questions about symmetry? This is the whole lecture is about symmetry. If you, if you have any puzzles, this is the time to ask. Yeah. Is there anything that wouldn't have symmetry if you were? Oh yeah, it? yeah. Lots of things don't have symmetry. I wasn't. I wasn't finished my question. I'm sorry. <laughs> if you if you rotate it 360 degrees. Oh, 360 degrees. Of course, everything comes back. So that's a boring symmetry. <laughs> or not doing anything is another symmetry. <laughs> that's right. Uh, but so there are. I mean, here this is this thing has a vertical symmetry. If it were a little <laughs> bit, it almost has a rotational symmetry around this axis, except that there's a pointer on here, so that, that's not fair. It's not symmetric because of the pointer, but if it didn't have the pointer, it would have a symmetry around the vertical axis and so on. If we take a sphere, I had a basketball without laces, uh, that's got symmetry about any axis through the center of the sphere. So it's, symmetri symmet it's perfectly symmetrical about any axis through any angle, because the sphere looks the same. So the sphere is the closest thing we have is the perfect symmetry, in that no matter what you do with it in the way of rotation <coughs> about the center, uh, it doesn't change. So, and the reason we're belaboring this is because, obviously because if you don't step carefully 
When you come into Fermi Lab, you'll trip on symmetry before you get in the door. Because symmetry is crucial to all of our design of experiments and our research here, and the theories, even the theorists who sleep late and don't come in until about one in the afternoon, but they also claim they worked hard, they're working on symmetry. Symmetry turns out to be a crucial concept, and that's why I'm uh, talking about it. I, uh, oh yeah, so here's my, my lecture. I'm gonna talk about uh, introducing symmetry. I'm gonna introduce a woman mathematician, probably one of the great mathematicians, uh, uh, arguably one of the greatest mathematicians that ever lived and couldn't get a job. She functioned around uh, 1910, 1915. Nobody hired women in those days. She was in Germany. Her father was a famous uh, mathematician, but that didn't help her get a job. Eventually, she came to the US uh, in the 19, late 20s, early 30s, and, and uh, had a wonderful few years before she got some dumb disease and died. And then I'm going to talk about uh, a particular case of the symmetry that I want to talk about, uh, which goes by the, uh, which is stimulated by Sundao Li and Nin Jing Yang, uh, two Chinese American scientists, theoretical physicists, who raised the question of a particular kind of symmetry that somebody mentioned as mirror symmetry. And uh, that's, so that's the, that's the lecture. So let me first show you pictures. This is the latest PowerPoint. It looks just as if I drew these by hand, <laughs> right? Okay, uh, so a vase is a good example of a uh, rotational symmetry about a vertical axis. Buildings, architects. The nice thing about symmetry is it really connects science, mathematics, and art, and architecture. It's a bridge, if you like, between the sciences and the humanities in many ways. There's aesthetics to the thing, you know, to symmetry, and uh, believe it or not, Physicists often are led to uh, believe in certain ideas in physics because they're beautiful. Certainly Einstein was a great proponent of the fact that uh, beauty is an important aspect in creating a theory. So here are some examples of symmetry. A flower might have rotational symmetry, but it's not continuous because there are five leaves, so you have to rotate to a fifth of one of the uh, circumference. Molecules will have symmetry, and biologists uh, took a great deal of attention, because if you have a symmetry, it saves you work. You don't have to look at the whole molecule. You can look at a part of the molecule and reduce the part you can't see because of a belief in symmetry. Take an example of a human being. I am a typical example. If I stand behind a screen, let's say, uh, with the screen covering half of me, by looking at one half, you can pretty much judge what's behind the screen. You say that there's a symmetry. It's a uh, bilateral symmetry is what it's called. And uh, you do have a left hand and a right hand, but there's a certain symmetry there uh, in, the, in, the, in most animal forms. Snow crystals are beautiful, complex symmetries, usually six-fold symmetry that has to do with the structure of molecules. So biologists are fascinated by classifying their complex molecules where they have hundreds of atoms sticking in all different directions uh, by notions of symmetry. And in mathematics, does anyone know what the form of mathematics is that deals with symmetry? You probably know. You know what it's called? Yeah. Group theory, that's right. It's called group theory. And I don't know why it isn't taught in high school. It should be, because it's important and it's not that complicated at some level. It says here, the consensus of scientists from Einstein on, and going all the way back to ancient Greece in three or 400 BC, uh, they were very interested, the Greeks were, and you know that from their sculpture and their architecture, were interested in symmetry, and uh, they had a belief that nature is somehow beholden to symmetry. 
Okay. So we got the definition of symmetry, and everybody seems to be happy with it. Uh, most of you who entered the laboratory would get an imp impression that the laboratory is interested in symmetry by looking at the gate uh, at Kirk Road. Uh, that uh, was designed by uh, Robert Wilson, the first director of Fermilab, and uh, it's entitled Broken Symmetry because it's symmetric, but it's not symmetric. It's symmetric if you look at it, you stand right in the middle and you look up, it's perfect symmetry. But if you go away from it, you see that the symmetry is not perfect. And it turns out that imperfect symmetry is a very important concept, as we'll see, in, in, in modern physics. So this was uh, Robert Wilson's sculpture at the entrance to the laboratory and the painting of the black and the orange, I think it is, is also very impressive because of the way it changes. But that's sort of a statement about the importance of symmetry. Okay. Now let's, go, let's uh, talk about some examples of symmetry and the most important examples are the great, what I call, continuous symmetries. The first symmetry is called space translation. So here's my system. Let's pretend, well, first of all, there are a lot of molecules in here, and let's pretend there are tiny scientists doing experiments in here, all kinds of things going on in here. Uh, or this could represent, you know, as a model for Fermilab. A big building, and all the rooms are occupied by scientists doing things, laboratory things of various kinds. Now, a translation means that I move the object from here to here. There's a mathematics to this. It's not very complicated mathematics. It says that in the original place, if I want to describe something, I use x, y, and z at some time t. x, y, z, t describes uh, a place and a time where something's happening. Now, if I move it over there, I'm changing all the values of x by 17 I don't know, things, 17 inches, or 17.3 inches. So now the mathematics changes. The mathematics describing the laws of physics that are in this original uh, experiment, the mathematics changes because everywhere uh, I see an x, I have to add 17 centimeters. Or I can make it more complicated by moving it here, then I have to change y also or I can move it up here and I have to change Z. So I change the mathematics. And of course, we always describe the laws of physics by mathematics, right? We describe it by mathematics and I'm changing the mathematics. Am I changing the laws of physics? Well, that would be kind of bad show because if you uh, went to college and studied physics here and somebody else was going to college and studying physics there, you should really get the same laws of physics, whether you're doing it out of a book or out of a laboratory. So you don't want the laws of physics to change. That would be very complicated. And in fact, a statement of the symmetry is that the system, whatever it is I'm talking about, Fermilab or the cup of coffee or an atom or a molecule, is invariant to a tr uh, in space to a space translation. That means you. you you, the the 16, 17 centimeters cancels out that I added to all the x's in the, sep, in the new experiment. It, it doesn't play any role. The same laws of physics happen here as happen here. In fact, Fermilab does a lot of research, and we have a laboratory in Switzerland called CERN. We love to hate them. <laughs> we compete with them, but we also collaborate with them. And Presumably, in two different places, we get the same laws of physics. If both of us are working on the properties of quarks and leptons, and we get the same properties. So that's a, a confirmation of the notion that uh, the system is a symmetry. If the laws of physics are the same whenever we change uh, location. So it's called space translation invariance. That's a symmetry. Another symmetry, then, is rotation. Here I go, spilling the coffee, I can rotate it through some axis. Uh, and uh, normally when I have a coordinate system that describes the physics, I take the, the z-axis and I point it someplace at the north star. Right? 
before, I pointed what I think is straight up, away from the center of the Earth, to be more scientific. Uh, now, and then the, the Y and Z, the X and Y axes are perpendicular. I could take this coordinate system and rotate it through any angle. And that's, that's the operation. And if the laws of physics don't change, then that's another symmetry. Rotational symmetry, and we already talked about some examples. I change, I rotate the cup through uh, 32 degrees, and the laws of physics say the same. So space, these look very obvious. They look like I haven't really told you much. And let me continue with the third one, which is time translation. We start our work at 9 o'clock in the morning. Got to come in on time. But the, our friends in CERN, they don't start their work until whatever it is, seven hours earlier or later, I can never figure it out. Whenever I'm in CERN and I carefully think about it, I call my wife and she says, it's three in the morning, stupid wife. <laughs> oh, I got the time wrong. But whatever it is, uh, a time translation doesn't change the laws of physics. The laws of physics are invariant to a change in the, in the time. So if I add to every equation, to go back to mathematics, some capital T, 16.3 nanoseconds, or 14.7 hours, or something, that time cancels out of all the equations. Doesn't appear. All you get, of course, are the fact that time variations. You get delta t's, you don't get t's, absolute times. That's time translation symmetry. These statements are not trivial because they're telling you something deep about space and time. They're telling you, in fact, that there are no extraordinary places in space such that if I moved, now I, uh, if I moved an ob object towards that place, the laws of physics would change. Now, you can argue there's a strong magnet here, and so when I move this here, all the iron filings here are moving towards the cup but I have to include the magnet in my system. So if the system has magnets here, I've got to use the whole system. And therefore, I move the whole system, and again, I get the invariance. So it does tell you that there's no specific structure to space. Space is smooth, homogeneous, both uh, uh, rotationally homogeneous and translationally homogeneous, and time is smooth. There's no special time. Now, people will always argue, well, what about the Big Bang? Isn't that a special time? And I'll say, get out. <laughs> we don't talk about the Big Bang. Or well, we have to include that. And to illustrate the depth of this, I'll now mention what Emmy Noether did. Most of her work was in pure mathematics, but the thing she's famous for is a physics theorem. And what she said, she proved mathematically is that every symmetry implies a law of conservation. That's a surprise. In other words, if I go now to translation and I say this is the symmetry that it doesn't matter whether my experiment is here or here, she was able to prove that that statement implies a law of conservation of momentum. And that's a well authenticated law, it's been checked billions of times, it's used by the Aurora police to analyze where the truck hit the car or who hit first by skid marks and so on, but they know about conservation of momentum. And we know about it in all our experiments here, that there is a law of conservation of momentum. The total momentum of a system is conserved. So if I have collisions, like head-on collisions, which we like to do at Fermilab, the total momentum is zero. So after the collision, the total momentum is zero. In the old days, we had a big beam going this way, and it hit something at rest. So the total momentum was not zero. And therefore, at the end of the collision, when they have all these particles, they're going off to equally incident momentum. That's a waste of energy. That's why we like head-on collisions. Because in head-on collisions, all of the energy can be, produced, can be used to create the top quark or some other particle. So I mean, Older said, every time there's a symmetry, there's a conservation law. Rotational uh, invariance implies the law of conservation of angular momentum. 
And that you see when the, the lady skater is uh, twirling around with her arms out, and then she draws her arms in, and she speeds up law of conservation of angular momentum. Uh, in physics one demonstrations, what I used to do, uh, there's a table that rotates, and I stand on the table with a dumbbell in each hand. It's called the three dumbbell experiment. Guess the third dumbbell. <laughs> and I hold the dumbbells out, and football player comes up and starts me rotating. And as I put the things in, I fall off the table. <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, an, an illustration of uh, conservation of angular momentum. Time translation. What's conserved when you say it doesn't matter uh, what time you begin the experiment? That's a surprise, maybe, to you. Turns out that that is the law of what's conserved energy. The law of conservation of energy is related to the smoothness of time, the lack of a discreteness in time. And somewhere in this book, we have a good example of what happens uh, to, to illustrate, uh, make, it, make it sensible that, uh, that there's a connection between the smoothness of time and the law of conservation of energy. So I'm not going to to labor that because I want to get to my story. There are other symmetries. Uh, let me talk about, somebody said, reflection in a mirror. Obviously, there's a strong connection between, and that's the one main theme I'm going to talk about today, is between uh, you and the mirror world. So let's think about how to illustrate that. Suppose this is, you're not sitting in chairs, you're all at workbenches with Bunsen burners and uh, flasks and you're doing things and setting things on fire and doing a nuclear experiment there. And one wall of this room is a mirror. Okay? So everything you're doing is reflected in the mirror. Now, here's the question. I come with a video camera. Somebody here has a video camera. Anyway, whatever. Oh, yeah, there's a video camera. And from outside, he videotapes and then shows this videotape to an impartial audience and says, is this the real world or the mirror world? Well, the first round you look for Alice. Is Alice around? Because she knows she's at home in both worlds. But if Alice isn't around, the question I ask the audience now is, could you tell from a videotape whether he's photographing the real scientists doing their experiments or the mirror scientists? Any opinions? Could you tell the difference? For example, I noticed that my shirt has buttons on the right side. Right? And that's the way, and I think women's shirts will go the other way. Well, okay, I could look at the mirror scientist and say, ha ha, his buttons are on the right side. It's the real world. Or the guy in the mirror has his buttons on the left side. But I could fool you, I could always sew the buttons on the other side. I wouldn't change any laws of physics, and we'd be fooled. Uh, there are a lot of other examples that would perhaps fool you, and maybe the most important one, and let me get to it now, is I'm going to, uh, I have a block of wood, and I have a screw, a wood screw, and I have a screwdriver, and I'm going to drive the wood screw into the block of wood. Now, what do I do? I take the screw from the box of screws, and I hammer it a little bit, and then I rotate clockwise, clockwise, you know, this way, and the screw goes into the wood. That gives you a hand, a handedness, because it says I'm rotating clockwise, and the screw advances. Let's define that as a right-handed screw. And sure enough, I look at the box of screws, and it says right-handed 832 wood screw. Something like that. Okay. What happens in the mirror? Think of the mirror. I'm rotating clockwise. The mirror guy is rotating counterclockwise, stupid. Let me see what I'm doing. I'm rotating clockwise. He's rotating counterclockwise. It's no different than I raise my right hand and the guy in the mirror raises his left hand. So, right? Think about it. You know, I raise my right hand, he raises left. So mirror changes handedness, if you can define handedness. And here we define it. Clockwise, advance. This guy is counterclockwise and it's advancing. He's got a left-handed screw in the mirror. 
Well, suppose left-handed screws were absolutely impossible. Actually, in the shop, on the second shelf, there's a box of left-handed screws. Where did that get there? Well, somebody needed left-handed screws for some carpentry work, and so they ordered a <coughs> box of left-handed screws. If we can make a right-handed screw, we can make a left-handed screw. So left-handed screws are not impossible. But suppose, for some crazy reason, in some planet, in some distant solar system, left-handed screws were impossible to make. Every time you try to make it, it would blow up or something. <laughs> then you would say, aha, there's no mirror symmetry. Because I can tell I have a right-handed screw and there's no left-handed screw, even though it looks like that in the mirror, so there's a violation of symmetry. So we can tell a violation of mirror symmetry by just the notion of the handedness. That, and so how does that come down to physics? Now we're getting close. Okay. Oh, well, let me just quickly go to some of these other symmetries and then go to my story. Uh, there's a symmetry which was discovered by Paul Dirac in 1927 when he was calculating to make an equation to describe the electron. He wanted the best possible equation, put in full of <laughs> Einstein's stuff, polished all the mathematics, and then he had to take the square root, and out of the square root came a plus and a minus charge for the electrons. There were two electrons, one with plus charge. We don't know a plus charge electron. That's crazy. And he worried about it, worried about it. We knew about plus charged protons, but a proton is very heavy. An electron is light, different particles. Eventually, he had to shrug his shoulders and say there must be, if my equations are correct, and I believe in my equations, they're just beautiful, they have to be right, there must be a positive electron. And sure enough, a few years later, they discovered the existence of a positive electron, which we call a positron. And Nowadays, you have hot and cold running positrons, you use positrons for medical research, all kinds of things with positive electrons. He discovered a symmetry that for every particle, which he called, uh, the, 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 has a twin, called, which we call a, the, a mirror twin, a mirror image, well, not, it didn't mean a mirror, it meant it had, it had a, an opposite charge. And we knew about the proton, and so there was a bet, $500 bet to physicists, friends of mine, that no one would ever find a negative proton. And sure enough, at Berkeley, they built an accelerator, and in 1950-something, they discovered the positive, the negative proton. So there's a symmetry. Every particle has an antiparticle twin, which has the same, very similar properties, except the sign of the electric charge. Now, a neutron, for example, doesn't have a any electric charge, but it does have a little magnet in it. And with a north pole here and a south pole there, and the, its twin, its antiparticle, anti-neutron, actually has the magnetic field the other way. So that's a symmetry. It doesn't have anything to do with space. It has to do with electric charge. So we're getting into interesting things. <laughs> T is an interesting thing because uh, it says that the Again, if, if these were correct symmetries, what it says is that, that uh, the mirror world that we talked about would have the same laws of physics. We didn't say what the result of our experiment is, but if you are doing the experiments and your mirror image is doing experiments and you write down the laws of physics, there'll be a difference in, in the, if I measure the distance from the mirror to, to you as z in the equations, the reflection will be minus z into the mirror. And if I check in my mathematics, it may be complicated differential equations, whatever it is, but if wherever I see z, I put a minus z, do I get the laws of physics change? Well, not if z always appears as z squared. Then you put in minus z, and it's still the same equations. And so there was a belief, uh, believed by all sensible scientists, even biologists and chemists, and probably even lawyers, that the laws of physics in the mirror must be the same as the laws of physics in the real world. Without Alice's testimony. Incidentally, the guy who wrote Alice in Wonderland was a mathematician. Uh, okay, uh, so that's, that's the, um, the mirror symmetry. And again, the question is, is there a planet somewhere, way out there somewhere in some distant uh, galaxy, 
in which all the matter is opposite. Negative protons, positive electrons, all that stuff. Well, if there was, then the belief in symmetry says they'd have the same laws of physics. The big problem would come when they visit us in their spaceship, which will be then made of anti-steel. <laughs> and we'd have to thought to worry if they landed, because we know that matter and antimatter annihilate and give rise to energy. <laughs> big explosions. We can see that when we make antiprotons in our lab. Here we make hot and cold burning antiprotons in Fermilab. We've stored antiprotons in our storage, magnetic storage bottle for weeks because in the vacuum nothing happens. But if they touch anything, they will react strongly. But the laws of physics seem to, uh, we thought were the same. And then there's a question of the direction of time. Now anybody looking at me will say, come on. Time only goes in one direction, unfortunately. Uh, but that's not true in simple systems. I'm a complicated system. But if I take particles and I do a reaction, particle A comes in, hits particle B, and C and D come off from the reaction. Then I say, let's reverse the time. Well, I reverse the experiment, and I get exactly what I started with in the first experiment. So there was a belief that the direction of time doesn't appear in the equations. Again, it's wherever you replace, you see a time, you say put in minus t, it doesn't change because t always comes in quadratically or, or in such a way that the negative sign never appears in variance. Well, in 1956 and so on, for reasons which I will not go into, because I'm going too slowly, uh, these two theoretical physicists raised the question, especially with these symmetries, they said, it may be that for certain uh, laws of physics, there's the symmetry works. For example, gravity. Here's the law of physics is the law of gravity. So uh, if I change, uh, if I reflect any experiment that has to do with gravity in a mirror, I'll get the same results, and that seems to have been checked accurately and precisely. Same thing with the properties of matter and antimatter. A transition uh, of this kind uh, would would uh, would look the, the mirror image would behave in exactly the same way, and so on. The issue they examined is what if what if uh, I have a particle which is radioactive because they were interested in the weak force. We know we have four forces, like gravity, strong force, electromagnetic force, and the weak force. The weak force gives rise to radioactivity. And they were interested in whether radioactivity obeys symmetry principles. We know about gravity and so on. So let's concentrate now on this one particular symmetry, which is mirror symmetry. And let's ask the question, suppose we do all these experiments with gravity, let's remember Galileo rolling something down an inclined plane and getting S equals one half A T. <laughs> suppose you watch that in the mirror, you get the same equations. That seems to work for almost any gravity, any gravity force you can try to test. That works. What about electricity and magnetism? Well, we know about electrons around protons. That makes an atom. So if I have an atom, that tests the laws of electricity and magnetism. Uh, does the same thing happen in a mirror? Yes. The mirror has atoms, and they behave exactly the same way, so that the laws of electricity and magnetism seem to be OK. But what about, I want to skip some of this, what about uh, a radioactive thing? So that's the thing we want to discuss. So first, let's review the mirror properties again. We already mentioned this. Here we have a big mirror, and here we have a person. He raises his right hand, and you see that the mirror is raising the left hand. That's the handedness problem. It doesn't mean that the laws of physics in the mirror are different. And as we said, we're trying to find this out. The fancy word for mirror symmetry is called parity. And don't ask me why. But parity is equivalent to mirror symmetry. And uh, mirror symmetry says that the mirror world is just as valid as the real world and that there's no way by any, any objective way that you could prove that um, 
that you're looking at the mirror world or the real world. It is true that a left-handed screw changes to a right-handed screw, but we have left-handed screws in our, in our world and in the mirror world, too. Okay. Now, back in, this is almost 50 years ago, plus or minus a few months, uh, I was a professor at Columbia University at that time. Nearby, there was the Brookhaven National Laboratory, and it was there in the summer of 56, in fact, that these two guys studying some data on the, on the decay of particles came to a bizarre conclusion. He, they said that the only way we could understand some of the data is to assume that the world in the mirror is different from the world, the real world. The real world and the mirror world have different laws of physics. They wrote a paper, The Question of Parity Conservation in Weak Interactions. That's, that's the key idea. That's the weak force. And they listed lots of examples uh, of how you might check this idea. <laughs> okay. So we already uh, mentioned the uh, the uh, the fact that uh, again a test of handedness is a good test. And here's the uh, right-handed screw. Here's the left-handed screw. But since the left-handed screw is certainly doesn't violate any law of physics, uh, it's not a test of parity because we do have left-handed screws. You just ask the shop for a left-handed screw, and you replicate the laws of physics in this way. Well, one of the experiments that um, Li and Yang proposed was carried out by Professor C.S. Wu, an experimental physicist at Columbia, using a radioactive substance, cobalt-60. Well, here's cobalt-60. Suppose, by a very complicated scheme, which we won't discuss in any detail, this cobalt-60 nucleus is spinning, just like a top. It's spinning like a top, and then we always use our right hand, and we say if the fingers curl in the direction of the spin, the thumb points in, uh, 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 in what we'll define as the direction of spin. In other words, the spin will be defined by your right hand by an axis like this. So here's cobalt 60 spinning. And then if you look at the mirror image of the cobalt 60, it's spinning as this one looks this way. This one is, is mirror image, and therefore the spin is in the opposite direction. So the mirror reverses the direction of spin. So what? OK. Everything is fine. There's no, nothing wrong because these two are identical systems. One is the other one upside down. Just turn it upside down. And uh, this cobalt 60 is the same as this. But suppose this cobalt 60 is radioactive and shoots off an electron. If it shoots off an electron, then the question is, where does the electron go? Well, you have to consider it shoots off lots of electrons and you measure the directions of those electrons. And just suppose that it was discovered that many more electrons come off in the direction of the spin has come off in the opposite direction. Why? Don't ask me why. It just That's nature, that the electrons coming off from a spinning cobalt like to go in the direction of the spin. Now, you have a parity problem, because here the electrons are going up. The mirror image electron should also go up. That's the mirror image. Instead, the mirror image electrons, the, the real cobalt will have the electrons going in this direction if that's the way nature is. Nature says electrons go in the direction of the spin. And uh, so this cobalt couldn't exist because we know that cobalt 60 electrons go in the direction of spin. The direction of spin is changed by the mirror, but the direction, that's we understand that. But the, the electrons direction you can't change in the mirror. So proving that more electrons come off in the direction of spin than come off in the opposite direction would show you that the mirror world is different from the real world. This is a little complicated, and so I want to uh, give you the experiment we did in 36 hours. Uh, 
Uh, well, first let me give you a little review of some of the nuclear physics. In an accelerator, and the experiment we did was at uh, Columbia University. It was in a laboratory about <clears throat> 30 miles north of the city, which accelerated protons to a huge energy of something like 400 million volts. We always laugh at that here, where we're <laughs> dealing with trillions of volts. Well, if a proton inside that accelerator hits a piece of copper or anything else with 400 million volts, you produce pions. These are unstable particles. Uh, they go about 10 or 20 feet in the air and then they disintegrate. And the reaction they give rise to is they <laughs> decay into a muon and a neutrino. Big story, but we're not going to be involved too much with that. But pions have a certain amount of energy, which when, when they disintegrate, while they're moving with a 50 or so million volts, the muons get most of that energy uh, shooting out. So you can then define a beam of muons from a beam of pi mesons, which come out of the accelerator. The muons themselves are unstable, and uh, they will disintegrate eventually into an electron and some neutrinos, which we don't care about. So now here is the muon spinning. And this is, uh, we happen to agree that, uh, that uh, uh, we could define this as the direction of spin. But if I turn it upside down, I'm not changing anything. So if I look at this, and I look at a mirror image of this, it's perfectly OK. One is upside down of the other. Big question is, what happens when this disintegrates into electrons? Some of them may go in the direction of the spin. Some of them may going to go in the opposite direction, and at 90 degrees, and all sorts of directions. So we have to know, what's the distribution of electrons? And the key is, if you believe in mirror symmetry, then there has to be an equal number coming in the direction of the spin is coming in the opposite direction. That's the key to the whole thing. And let me, because it's crucial, let me give you one more picture. Here's the muon and here's the mirror image. And here's my right hand rule, which says the spin is in that direction, but if I look at this picture, it's this one upside down. So these two are perfectly sensible mirror images. Does the mirror image image exists in the real world? And the answer is yes, this thing exists in the real world because it's just upside down. Now, let's take uh, a whole bunch of muons and look at the electrons. And we discover in this particular case that the electrons coming off from the disintegrating muon, most of them like to go off in the direction of the spin. Now we have a kind of direction. We have a hand. Here we had no hand. We just had a rotation. But here, we have a rotation and a direction. So we have a hand. And now we can look at the mirror image. And here's the mirror image, as best I can show it. But this thing doesn't exist. Because if muons always have electrons coming off in what we call the direction of the spin, this one is not doing that. The direction of the spin is down. And yet, the electrons are going up. So this doesn't exist in the real world. And therefore, mirror symmetry doesn't exist if this is the result, if this is the result of the experiment. Everybody see that? Anybody see that? <laughs> OK, let me tell you the story now. Well, I've got to go fast in my story. Uh, it began Friday, January 4th at Columbia. We have a tradition of a Chinese lunch. So somewhere in a book I wrote, I give it detail about the menu with this Chinese lunch, because Professor Lee is a, uh, an expert on Chinese cuisine, especially uh, Sichuan and Fukien type, northern Chinese cooking. And it's not terribly relevant. <coughs> uh, while we were there, we were discussing uh, uh, rumors and so on. And uh, the, the results of our uh, colleague, C.S. Wu, who was doing her experiment, in Washington, D.C., because she needed very low temperatures to get the cobalts to line up uh, their spins. And uh, she was making interesting progress. That was the idea. I then drove back to Columbia, which is uh, to the laboratory, which is about 30 miles north. It's called Nevis. 
and I lived near there, so I stopped for a quick dinner. And on the way, driving, uh, I kept thinking about the report that maybe the decay of Cobalt 60 was doing something very interesting. So somewhere around that evening, I had the idea that we could do the same experiment uh, at the Columbia Laboratory because we make pions and we already had one student who was doing his thesis research with pions. Okay. If parity is violated in the pi mu decay, the muons will be born with their spins all in the direction of their motion and the beam will be swept out of the accelerator and into the laboratory we will have a beam, beam of muons all spinning in the same direction. Well, that's crucial because then we can look at the, where the electrons are coming. Are they coming out in the direction of the spin? Equal numbers in the direction and opposite, distributed uniformly, what will the distribution be? At that point, I got a call from a colleague, Richard Garwin, who actually works at IBM, but hangs around Fermilab. And uh, I invited him to, uh, join us because I said that evening, I think I can take the student's experiment, that was Marcel. He's working on his PhD, but with a few rearrangements of his apparatus, uh, we could test this experiment. So he uh, drove over and uh, we started to rearrange Marcel's experiment. Marcel wants to get a PhD, he doesn't care about parity. So he started crying. <laughs> uh, but we, uh, we calmed him down a little bit. And then uh, we began to think about how to do the experiment. So here's a picture maybe I can give you. The accelerator is back here, sort of a big thing. Uh, the protons smash into a target just at the edge of the magnetic field. Out come the pions. And while they're going through a 10-foot thick uh, concrete wall that protects the laboratory from the radiation and the accelerator, uh, uh, a big fraction of them decay into muons, and then we, we put in a piece of carbon that stops the pions and the muons stop in this block, and we have counters that tell us that this is happening. We arrange these counters, we have to uh, take apart pretty much a lot of what Marcel did, and every time we did he would cry some more. You know. Uh, okay, so now we have a block of uh, carbon with uh, where the muons stop. And now we want to find out uh, where the electrons go. Well, we had some counters. Let me uh, try to show this a little bit better. Maybe, yes. Okay, here's actually the, the uh, apparatus as we worked it out. The pion beam came in here. The total number of counters in the experiment was four counters. That's all we needed. Uh, the, the protons would stop in this block of carbon. We put this block of carbon into a lucite cylinder and wrapped some wire around the cylinder. And so instead of moving the counters to find out, see, we know, we know that the spins are now lined up in this carbon, they're all pointing, let's say, uh, in this direction, towards you. And now we're looking for electrons, and so we take these electron the telescope, it's called, and move it around, except that Garwin had a better idea. He said, don't move this heavy stuff around. Let's just put a magnetic field around the muons, and the muons, being magnetic, would precess, would turn in the magnetic field. So the muons would change their directions, and we could watch the counting rate here change as the muons, uh, elect uh, as the electrons, if there were a lot of electrons coming out in the direction of the spin, when they illuminated these counters, the counting rate would be high, and when they went in the other direction, the counting rate would be low. So everything depended on turning on this magnetic field and watching the counting rate change. Simple experiment. And uh, by midnight, I think we had everything ready to go. Well, yeah, I think it was Saturday morning. This was Friday night, so Saturday morning, all the counters were working. That was easy. We already had four counters. Everything seemed to be 
behaving right, and then we started to see a change in counting rate as the electrons, uh, as the muons were turning. By 4 a.m., the effect started to go away, and when they turned off the accelerator at 9 a.m. for maintenance, uh, there was no, no noticeable effect, even though we were very excited. Uh, so Saturday morning when they turned off the accelerator for them to let us run for another few hours, but they refused. <clears throat> hey, bad guys. We went down into the cyclotron to see what happened, and we found that the lucite cylinder in which we had jammed the piece of carbon and had round the, put the wires around the lucite, the lucite melted because the wires were hot and the carbon fell down. And all of a sudden, our spirits increased because something we had slopped up the way we arranged the experiment. So we spent the weekend, there's all the time intervals, repairing the stuff, making a better system, wrapping the wire directly on the carbon, uh, taking turns going to sleep, uh, and, uh, and then starting the experiment again. Uh, let's see, here it goes, yeah, midnight, the data taking resumed. I went home to sleep at 3 a.m. Marcel was sleeping already, uh, still crying. <laughs> uh, we started crying when we saw the apparatus. All of us were crying. And at uh, 6.30 a.m., I get a telephone call, even though I only have three hours sleep. Darwin called and said, you better come into the lab. We've got a 22 standard deviation effect. So here's here's the here's well here's a picture that tries to make this a little clearer. Here's the muon sitting there, and a spray of electrons. That means there's a lot of muons. Every muon gives only one electron, but you're doing this over and over again, and so you get a counting rate, let's say, of at this direction. But this muon is turning in our magnetic field, so at some time t equals zero five counts per second. Then a little bit later, the full blast of electrons is coming, 12 counts a second. You see, because I've taken a, a case in which most of the electrons are coming off in the direction of the spin. It's the asymmetry, the electrons going this way versus this way, that determines the asymmetry. And so you see a counting rate change as the muon turns around. If there were symmetry, electrons equal numbers here, you would see no change in the counting rate. So here's the data after uh, uh, some six or eight hours of data taking. If parity were conserved, if mirror symmetry were valid, all these points would be the same. Instead, we have this perfect example of a spin rotating and giving us more electrons, less electrons, more electrons, less electrons. So, by Saturday, by Tuesday, this was now Tuesday morning, we had uh, made a major, major discovery, namely that mirror symmetry was not valid. And uh, this uh, um, got, the word got out, crowds came for, see what we were doing. Uh, pretty soon we started getting telephone calls from France, from England, from Russia, where they had cyclotrons like ours, and people were saying exactly what you did so they could rush and do the same experiment. And uh, meanwhile, we decided that we better publish our results. So here's the experiment. It says observation of the failure of conservation of parity, and also charge conjugation, which is the process of particles going to any particles. Both of them are not valid in mirror symmetry. Here's the apparatus I told you about. And this shows something like 10 different conclusions about the nature of, of the experiment. So if you add up the amount of time we spent taking data, it was about 36 hours. And here's the experiment with Garwin, Letterman, and Weinreich, who had stopped crying and seemed very cheerful now. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to show you here is I found a page of the discovery of the top court by the CDF collaboration here a few years ago, and I can only find uh, the second half. So this starts with the M's and goes to the Z's. So there's another page. The 
thing is that this experiment had uh, 400 collaborators uh, and took oh, four or five years to get the data on the top core. And this experiment took 36 hours and had three collaborators, one of whom was crying most of the time. <laughs> so that just shows you that times have changed.